Okay, welcome everyone. As people are coming in, I'm just going to play a little bit of um, Art Jones' um, documentary. Let me just share my screen. Okay. And here we go. I'm Jackson. Those who know me call me Prince. The Mindful Resolution Project is something I've been working on with um, Professor Christina Zaccarini. That was released from prison on May 23rd, 2017. And I currently serve as the network outreach coordinator, making sure that all the formerly incarcerated individuals who are, who are participants of network are fully accessible to the students. It was really something that kind of blew my mind. I always thought that someone who went to prison is a bad person. I never expected them to come out as like a different human being. When I interviewed Lennon, I saw how he was able to grow and take his time in prison to rethink his choices and understand what his wants and needs were. That was one thing that I learned from him is that patience was really important. And so recently, a couple of weeks ago, he received a full-time job. Uh, he's also very thankful that his family is supporting him through his through this hard time. And hopefully he can get back on his feet and get himself a home by himself. This is very important to my career. I want to become a nurse. You can't judge a person based on where they were or what they did. Instead, observe and put yourself into their shoes. Good afternoon, everyone. I did not expect myself to be incredibly fascinated by the lives of these formerly incarcerated individuals and how they've grown and transitioned back into society. In my recent interview with Damian Rosney, he has given me lots of insight into the struggles that some of them face, housing, employment, and or reconnection with their families. He says, I essentially came home at the age of 34, having never been a free man. So it was very hard to adjust to, um, to find my place in the world. Now I aspire to be an elementary school teacher. And one factor that I see that is most common in incarcerated individuals is childhood trauma. Now, as a future instructor, I vow to prioritize the needs of my students in any way that I can. I interviewed Michael, who in my opinion is an extremely hardworking person and very ambitious. I feel that applying mindfulness to his life, it helps Michael become more self-aware and really understand what's going on around him. Taking this course was an amazing mm -hmm. opportunity for me because it truly taught me how to be a more empathetic person towards other people. I want to be a lawyer, and I realized that working with people in the future, I'll need to understand how to relate to them and understand what they're going through. As I listened to this young woman give her feedback on the interview, I was picturing her in front of a Senate committee, making the case why criminal justice reform is necessary. So I'm Graciela Fusaro, and I'm the director of the Innovation Center. Okay. So welcome, everyone. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Lake will give the more formal welcome. Okay. Hello, everyone. A lot on for two seconds. Um, Sorry about that, folks. The video that you saw is also on the website. It's a 10 minute video. It's not very long and it's really excellent. It's very well done and really powerful. So if you get the chance to see it, please, please do. It's hard when we're trying to triangulate different computers with masks on. Welcome to the 10th event, 10th or 11th event in the Artivism series, fall 2021, 2021 semester. For those not familiar with the initiative, Artivism is an interdisciplinary, multi-institutional collaboration designed to engage people in changing society through the power of, the, power of art to generate community through cross-constituency teamwork in the process. What began as a one semester project has evolved into a multi-year international series, bringing together artivists from all over the world who shared their inspiring work with us. 
connecting and collaborating with other artivism partners in ways that are both powerful and productive, and inspiring the student ambassadors assigned to work with them. Today, our student ambassador is Fiorella Albinis. Albinis, did I pronounce it right, Fiorella? Yes. Uh, junior political science major at Adelphi who participated in the Latino Student Association and the Multilingual Club and serves as an Italian tutor on campus. Outside of school, Fiorella is a member of Next Generation Lideres, a program for future lawyers run through the- Oh, yeah, I'm still working on it. I'm gonna look it over. No. Let's all, let's all mute our computers, folks, if we're not speaking. Thank you. Outside of school, uh, she also coaches lacrosse on the weekends and she tutors children in Kazakhstan via Zoom. Fiorella's plan to enter the legal profession stems from a deep passion and desire to help others, giving voice to those who are too often ignored and shedding light on injustices that are otherwise overlooked. The Artivism program here at Adelphi enables this goal beautifully by highlighting such matters through creative endeavors and artwork. Fiorella is very thankful for all the amazing faculty. Come on in. She has worked with throughout her years at Adelphi, special, especially Professor Agilarakis and Prof Professor Zaccarini. If you are interested in serving as a student ambassador in the future, we have openings even for this semester, this semester or next, please contact me. I would now like to welcome Fiorella. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you all today. As Dr. Lake mentioned, my name is Fiorella Albinez, and I'm a junior political science major here at Adelphi. I'm very thankful for the amazing faculty I've met, especially Professor R.G. and Professor Zaccarini, who have been like my mentors throughout this time. Um, during my time here, as um, Dr. Lake said, I'm part of the Latino Student Association Multilingual Club, as I speak English, Spanish, and Italian, and I'm an Italian tutor on campus. Outside of school, I'm a member of Next Generation Leaders, a program for future lawyers by Latino justice. During the week, I teach English to kids in Kazakhstan via Zoom and coach girls across on weekends. My desire for becoming a lawyer stems from my deep passion for helping others, voicing those who go unheard, and shedding light on injustices that are otherwise overlooked. The Artivism program here at Adelphi executes this beautifully by bringing up these matters through artwork. I would now like to introduce our presenters. Dr. Art Jones heads Great Jones Productions in New York, making films that make change. His feature films and social justice documentaries fuse filmmaking with outreach and community building to spur social action. Professor Zaccarini has been a full-time history professor at Adelphi for 20 years with publications in American history, specializing in women and culture. Professor Zaccarini works with network support services and especially Mr. Nishan Jackson, outreach coordinator to create a database capturing the experiences of those re-entering society while seeking to assist them in their efforts. I also had Professor Z Zaccarini as a history professor and she really incorporated mindfulness into the classroom and helped us um, dissect historical events or even people from a non-judgmental perspective. So I'd like to thank her because this class was truly like uh, no other that I've taken, I think in all of my time studying history. Mr. Nishan Jackson, Network Support Services Outreach Coordinator, brainstormed with Professor Zaccarini to come up with the idea for the Mindfulness Resolution Project, and he provided tremendous insight and inspiration for students. Mr. Jackson works tirelessly to connect Professor Zaccarini to network clients, and his knowledge of mindfulness and the criminal justice system is exceptional. Without Mr. Jackson, there would be no Mindfulness Resolution Project and no documentary. Okay. Um, so um, thank you, Fiorella, for the wonderful introduction. Um, who will begin? Dr. Zaccarini or Art and Ashan? Um, okay, I can start. Okay, Great. so I will start. Um, so uh, Nashan and I began this project in the summer of 2020. And we, it was really a leap of faith. We didn't know how it would turn out. And we connected our students um, to the network alumni who are individuals who 
well, actually re-entered society from incarceration some even a month before uh, our class started. So they really were very generous in giving us their time. And what brought my students together with them and Ashan is the study of mindfulness. And so it may be something that you've heard, everybody's talking about mindfulness, it's the catchy you know, term that everyone's using, but it really is about not just being in the present, but also having a knowledge of self and also an awareness of one's thoughts, what we're thinking. Um, it's also about having compassion for the self and compassion for others. And so just as my students studied mindfulness, the men who come from the network program study mindfulness. And it was from that perspective that we could all come together. And the students also studied history and especially historical individuals who were mindful themselves, um, such as uh, Martin Luther King and, um, you know, we studied um, Malcolm X and Angela Davis. And we trace these individuals to the uh, events that occurred in the 90s, in the 2000s, the war on crime and the crime bill of 1994. And so those things were all book knowledge until my students met the men from Network Support Services. And they were really pretty intimidated going into this. And some of them, you know, were very close to chickening out. But um, they went through and it was so beautiful that the men in the program taught my students a lot and really revealed how they cared so much about our students at Adelphi and our students knew it. So it was really a life-changing experience. So we were very lucky that um, we got this amazing uh, filmmaker, Art Jones, to capture this on film. And he put tremendous work into this beautiful documentary capturing the experiences of our students and the experiences of the men in network. And I just wanna also thank um, Fiorella because those were beautiful words that I will never forget. And I will, I'm glad that this is recorded so I could hear it again. And you were a wonderful student as well. So my work in history continues to incorporate mindfulness, you know, and I, I try to, I try to, um, to make history relevant. So I guess on that note, I'd love to hear what um, Art Jones has to say about making the documentary and um, about how he turned this project into art, which is really amazing. And I'm so grateful for that. Sure. Well, well thank you all for, for having me. And I'm very happy to be part of the, uh, the team that kind of brought this, this film together. And I, when I think of uh, team, I think of Nashon Jackson. I think of Dr. Zaccarini. And um, kind of conversations that I had uh, just prior to, uh, before the semester began, I think it was the fall semester, about a year ago at this time. Um, I know Nishan because I am a, I'm a board member with Network Support Services. And Network is, is really a very special organization that provides men and women inside prison the opportunity to really turn their lives around. And uh, so much of it is done not just through, uh, through training and through discussion, but really with mindfulness as, as a centerpiece. And network goes beyond simply providing programming inside prisons. It's very much interested in the entire journey of the man or woman inside who's really preparing to, to come home again. And Network is there with the help of Nashon and others on his team to receive these men and women back into the community as they re-enter re society. And, and that's really a tough jump from, uh, from prison life back to a world that many of these folks sometimes haven't seen for 20, 30, even 40 years. Um, so this is kind of an amazing arc that Matt Sean has been part of and what a natural fit to bring his experience as kind of as a leader, as somebody who understands this journey, but has also helped bring hundreds of men and women home 
get them settled and get them started on a new life that they have defined for themselves over the years. So this is the context from which, you know, I got involved. I joined a network as a volunteer uh, about four years ago, and I trained and uh, once a week have been going to an upstate facility, uh, Woodburn Correctional Facility, working with a group of about 30 men in one of the network programs. So I drive upstate once a week on Thursday evenings and join what is really a, a, a therapeutic community, a circle of men who are finally able to build some trust in a community within the last place you'd expect to find community and trust, and that's inside prison. And, uh, you know, these uh, are 30 individuals, uh, predominantly Black and Hispanic, um, all who have pretty much come from two or three neighborhoods in Brooklyn. You know, so here are, here are these, you know, a community of men that have been imprisoned upstate, that are hidden away in the hills, in prisons that look much like the facility you saw in the Shawshank Redemption. And um, these are people doing amazing work together as a group to really sort out what got them in prison, to really face um, those pivotal moments that, that got them into the trouble that they were in, but also coming to grips with taking responsibility for one's life and now creating a, a pathway forward, envisioning a new future. So I found all this stuff fascinating and the more I got to know the men that I saw every Thursday night, they became brothers. I mean, this was a place where we could all speak freely and realize there was such a, a commonality in terms of love for family, for children, aspirations, dreams. The big difference is they've been behind bars for 20 or 30 years, and many of them uh, there for way too long. So Network is an amazing organization that helps these men on their path, doesn't do the work for them. It creates a platform. And then you have someone like Nashawn Jackson, who'll speak soon, who, who receives them beautifully you know, and brings them into this world and is thinking about how do we get them housing, which is needed? How do we find them employment, which is there are usually any number of barriers that get in their way. These men and women return uh, with a heavy duty stigma. And uh, the stigma uh, was revealed, was kind of uh, explored within Dr. Zacharini's class. And, and this is where, I, this is my long way of saying, I know Nashon. He said there's going to be a class this uh, coming semester. He said, I'm going to speak when it's finished, and I'd love you to, to roll on that. Could you capture that? And so I just said, whatever you do, do I will be there with a the film crew, and we will capture your words. Because Nashon speaks like a poet, and he speaks powerfully. And you get in his presence for five minutes, and you are ready. It's like, you are my leader. Take me. You know, what, what you want to do, I'll get behind. And you'll hear him when he speaks. So uh, over time, it became clear that there was an entire class about history, prison reform, and mindfulness. That this class had been carefully structured by Professor Zacharini and uh, intersected with Nashan's wisdom. Here was this laboratory like no other. Uh, here was a chance to explore. Uh, the basics of, of prison reform to look at history and recent history and history that is really so much of America's true history, but to possibly bring in the voices of men who lived that history and lived it differently and could inform readings, could inform pivotal moments in history, uh, milestones in, in the struggle of certain people, these men had firsthand knowledge of it, bring them into the classroom. You know, if you're gonna talk about prison reform, speak to people who know what it was like going in, who know the neighborhoods and the conditions that they were up against when they went inside, but men who have had time to reflect on what's up, what's wrong, how could it be done better? 
then when they get outside, how do they be part of that movement to make change in that realm? So I said, you know, immediately, uh, if all this is coming together and it all culminates in a final presentation in November with the students actually being able to speak about their experience of working one-on-one -on -one with a formerly incarcerated individual, I said, I've got to be there, you know? There's no place, in fact, I'm, I'm mapping out November whenever it hits, I'm gonna be there, I'm not gonna travel. So my background is, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a documentary filmmaker, I've been doing it for 30 years, I've run a production company since the early 90s when I got out of college, and it's my way of earning a living, but it's also my way of kind of swimming through the world and exploring and getting at things that are important to me and shedding light on topics that, um, that either I wanna get into deeper because I wanna know or because there's a community that is struggling to make change. Can I help them by making a film and spreading the word? Or how do I bring certain, I'm gonna say bold models for change how do I put them on camera and share them and share that model? The same way that I'm looking at this classroom experience at Adelphi, Mindfulness 101, how could this model also be shared uh, in multiple classrooms at Adelphi? How could it be shared throughout the New York area? How does it become the basis for a national network of classes that really take a very different approach to? looking at history, to diving into social action, to allowing students to explore in such a different way and find something about themselves and their own purpose in the process. So without overwhelming you know, the parameters of a film, you know, I kind of said, okay, I've done documentaries and feature films in the past. Um, many of them are rooted in social justice or that they are, there is a, uh, a key core of American culture that if you tell a story and that kind of it's all anchored by something that means something to a community, to a larger issue at hand, then you've got a film that's worth watching, something that entertains, but also leaves somebody with some nutrition, some substance and something, the fire in the belly to make change as a result of seeing this piece. Um, so uh, I knew that you know we, we would have a series of voices of students speaking in a classroom, that Nishan would be there, that Professor Zaccarini would provide a framework for anyone first visiting this classroom, um, so that there was a context. But it was really important to somehow capture the collision, the intersection between the students' work and the one-on-one -on -one relationships they had developed in a scholarly and a very human way with the formerly incarcerated men that Nashon had brought in to network with things. So ideally, I would have loved to have seen the men in the classroom, not only speaking, but working one-on-one -on -one with the students. And during COVID, that's not possible. But I knew I had never, I just had never heard of a course like this before. And when you see a first of a kind uh, model that really has traction, you know, uh, it's, it, it's a green light for my team and I. So with three cameras, me and six other folks, we came in, set up in the classroom. And the, the, the basic idea is that you know that there's gonna be a presentation for an hour and 15 minutes. You can put up your iPhone for that. But the truth is for a larger world in which some viewers on YouTube, on Facebook, through Instagram and other sources, not everybody already, already has a, a core interest in the subject matter. You've got to make it accessible to them. You've got to bring them in. So that hour and 15 minutes, you know, has got to come down to five or 10 minutes at most. And that's kind of where the power of allowing people to tell a story and how you capture it and shape it, you know, that's, I'm not going to say that's where the art comes in. I do this kind of without thinking, you know, this whole idea of a, a seminar today or a, a discussion about the, the art of it. Um, 
I don't really see it that way. And it's just kind of natural. Why would you not capture powerful student voices who speak with passion about an experience they had? Why wouldn't you do it with strong lensing and three angles and record their voice so the audio quality is there so that whatever they bring to it, you get it fully. You respect what they've created with putting a quality crew and a quality production together so that no one watching this is losing their mind because the technical flaws or they can't hear the audio. I wanna amplify voices that need to be heard to bring about change. And I, I'm sure almost everyone participating in this seminar and those who've already spoken are already on that tip. How do we amplify? How do we share stories from voices rarely heard? How do we open the eyes of those people who have ignored the issues, don't know about it, but need to be woken up? And better yet, how do you get them a little bit fired up so when they finish watching a film, watching a presentation, attending a rally, they're ready to be activated and not just to nod ahead or say, hey, wasn't that a great experience, but to say, I want to be part of this change and how do I team up? So ultimately, in a 10 minute film, you are hoping that this thing goes further, farther, thousands of miles to other places and other people that you never thought you might reach. But suddenly this collection of voices is introducing them to 18 year old students who had incredible courage, fortitude, and a willingness on their own part to look deep within themselves and to team up with individuals who unfortunately society sees um, with a stigma. And these students that we're capturing begin to realize that we, we, we've got to push the stigma aside and we've got to welcome these men and women home and bring them into our communities and set them loose to do what they need to do to rebuild community. We need to do that without judgment and the like. So um, even though each student gets up and speaks about their experience, their one-on-one -on -one experience with exploring readings and the life of the formerly incarcerated person, even though um, they might need an hour to express that, they've had to compress their words into 10 minutes, and it's our job to take it down to two pithy minutes. Um, so, you know, in, in all, we're hoping to weave together kind of this tapestry, this chorus of voices, each voice individual, but in the end, singing like a choir, hitting those notes that hopefully have, have struck chords, you know, that have, have woken someone up, that that person watching hits the stop button for, for the next two hours or four days, they can't get that student, Alicia, out of their mind. Or Nashon's words of wisdoms, or Aurel Smith, who appears in the, the film, who uh, was finally released after about 24 years. You can't get their voice, their wisdom, their vision for a path forward. You can't get it out of your head, and you got to do something about it. Um, yes, there's a little bit of theme music in there, because I, I truly believe that when people lay out a story of respect and nobility, Everybody deserves a little bit of theme music, you know? Um, I, I wish there were certain instances when I moved through this world and met with clients or met with some new people and I had a 10 piece band behind me, you know, rocking out a tune to, to rise with my words. It doesn't happen, but in film you can do it. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, most importantly, it was getting the quality of voice in the eyes of the students, um, get it captured with a little bit of flicker and a little bit of fire. And uh, you know, enough people who've seen this have commented on just how impressed they are with students at age 18 or 19 who are already thinking about their place in the world or what they might do with their talents upon graduation and how their work in this class has opened their eyes, how their work and their relationship evolved with the men that they were paired with, how that influenced their, 
their career paths towards psychology or social work or history. You know, listen, I used to teach up at uh, Hunter College for years, and there were seniors there who were still trying to figure it out. And, and God love them. You, you, should, you should always keep searching and always keep exploring about what's important to you. What should I be doing in this world? Hell, I'm still doing it. And most of my friends, if they're honest, they sit down with me and they say, Art, we're still figuring it out. Where, what should I be doing? What's my purpose? Um, for these young folks in this class to be that courageous, to be open to possibilities already, and to say, hey, I, I may take classes differently at Adelphi as a result. I may dive deeper into this process. You know, to me, that's amazing. And, and that's the transformation um, that I look for. I mean, if you really want to talk about art and art in action, you know, it's, it's in the transformation and what gets sparked. And I think there's something beautifully artful about the journeys of this, these students in this classroom who came in with a story that they thought they knew about themselves. They thought they knew who they were. They took this journey for a semester and walked side by side with these men with the guidance of Professor Zacharini and now shown in the classroom. And where they might have started at point A, but their point B, beautiful story arc, they found change. And they found uh, the power of mindfulness in their own life. And I think they left that classroom, I'm going to say different people, different for the better for the stronger, um, you know, to me, that, that's kind of what lives in this film. And, and my greatest hope is, you know, seeing strong 18 year old voices and knowing we're in good hands as long as they, they get into action and they, and they do their thing, you know? So this is, I, I will end my long soliloquy here. I apologize for beating you down for 17 minutes, but, um, I love the men that I work with inside prison. And every man, right now it's men, our program is, is expanding to include women this coming year. But when they're released from prison, I, I, I do my best to be somebody who meets them at the train station or at the Port Authority when they first get home. And those who are willing, let me film them. Um, we, I work really hard to work with the Department of Corrections to actually get inside Woodburn Prison just before COVID hit. And I was able to spend a lot of time capturing the work of the men inside prison as they work together within the network therapeutic community. And it's a look at prison you've never seen before. You know, everybody watches films like Con Air, or they watch television uh, series called, you know, the toughest prisons around the world. Um, prison doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be portrayed as these violent, lonely, separate places, though in many cases they are. But thanks to men uh, in network and in other therapeutic programs who create a brotherhood, um, there's something else to be seen on the inside. And I think the documentary footage we've captured, which I hope to share in an upcoming film for Netflix uh, early next year, and I hope the footage that we capture of the men as they come home, making strides to reconnect with family, to join a community and to make it even better when they left it. To me, that's powerful and that's where I wanna go. Um, but uh, a, a film in 10 minutes like this, um, you know, we've talked about it before, Professor Zachary and Eshan and others and I, I hope it continues to be spread because it's a model, it's a collection of voices, it's a movement that needs to be shared. And, and filmmaking can do it like no other medium because it makes essential emotional connections as it lays down some heavy duty information. But it's that emotional connections and when you meet these men and you meet their humanity, you, you can't help but connect. And um, I'm just so happy that uh, they shared their lives in this classroom, continue to stay involved in network and hopefully continue to participate in the Adelphi program that Professor Zacharini has created. So 
Um, with that, you know, Nashawn Jackson, I, I, I mentioned your name 400 times in the last 20 minutes. Uh, I would love you to jump on. You are my hero. And, uh, and every time I see you, you give me 20,000 volts of energy. So if you would share 1,000 volts right now, that'd be great. Thank you, Art. Simplicity. I'm a simple person. I'm a simple man. I like simple things. Uh, Farella, thank you for that introduction. Um, so where do I begin? I was formerly incarcerated, served 25 years of incarceration for a crime that I did not commit. And I'm currently still fighting for my liberation to be free. Um, so I um, had the liberty and privilege to attend the Network in the Prison program at Otisville Correctional Facility back in 2015. And being in that community, it was a type of community where you felt safe. It was different from the general inmate population where all of the negative energy and issues of life constantly, you know, buying people down with grief and all that. We was in an environment where each, each other supported each other. It was a positive environment for human development where individuals can help themselves and each other. And so being a part of that community allowed me to recognize the change that I really needed within inside myself in order to ascend or rise or grow into the purpose of who I am. Because I believe that we all have purpose in this life and we all searching. And fortunately enough, my purpose became defined through the network program. So as the member, I began to um, conform to the rules because you have to sign a contract in order to participate in our program because it's very intense. It's a very intense therapeutic program. And you would have to sign a contract stating that one, um, you recognize change needed within yourself. And two, that you'd be willing to do whatever it is to affect that change while participating in the program. So I committed myself and from an ordinary member, I assumed the role as a group leader. And so as a group leader, um, I would charge of nine individuals. The dormitory setting consisted of 50 souls. And I was one of the group leaders the 50 was broken down to five groups, 10 to each group. Mm -hmm. And from that point, um, it allowed me to know that I am a leader because what network actually does, whatever's innate, because it's a positive environment, it brings it out. <laughs> it brings it out of you because there's nothing but activities that's going on. And it allows you to bring into that process your own method of modes of creativity, you know? And so I was able to um, express my mode of creativity, my gift, which was that of leadership. Because I was growing up, I always wanted to be one of those guys like on the front line, you know? I love challenges, right? When people say no, I say yes. The crowd's going that way, I'm going the other way. <laughs> you know, that's what life is about, challenges. See how well you can overcome any obstacle that's placed before you. So then I decided, you know what? <clears throat> I'm gonna submit my name because one time he was going around, we needed a, a co-coordinator for the program. Cause you have a, a, a system that's set up where you have the coordinator the core coordinator and you have the five group leaders. They're known together as the steering committee. They come together from time to time and they discuss the state of the dorm and you know they meet from time to time with the executive director that used to come in the facility and sit down with us and to get assessment as to what exactly we further need and support to make this program become more effective. Um, so I was elected by the community to serve as their co-coordinator. And I was a privilege and an honor because it allowed me to know that I was on the right track. Mind you, before I became a part of the um, network, 
my mind was in the area where Pharrell um, is at in the law. I wanted to become a lawyer. I'm a, I'm a paralegal as of right now, but unfortunately the conviction um, prevents me from, you know, going through the system to become a member of the bar. But anyway, um, I wanted to open up a law firm upon my release. You know, I, I wanted to start a law firm where it's serving incarcerated individuals, helping them with their post convictions and things like that, helping them get out. But I never imagined that um, upon my release that I'd be working for network. So during my, la my, my, my later days in network program, making that transition because I was finally um, given a, a, a release date. Um, the community had confidence in my leadership and so when there was a vacancy for the coordinator, I was elected again to serve as a community coordinator. And again, I was privileged and an honor to serve that community. Then the former executive director, Ann Williams, um, she passed away. Um, she wanted me to work for the network in the community program, the actual company, the, co the actual corporation, Network Support Service Incorporated. And she wanted me to build her an office of outreach. And I was on it, even though at that time, I didn't know what an office of outreach consists of. So like I was sharing with Art, I had to Google that terminology, outreach, what does that mean? So when I found out, exactly what outreach means and what it entails i started building an office around that and i just feel good and proudly to say that i have over 120 something clients that um i'm able to interact with on behalf of network helping them um these individuals they had the benefit to experience our network discharge and resettlement program which basically allows the individuals who are in our program upon their release, it gives them an opportunity to have free transportation and to pick them up and deliver where they have to go. Um, we give them free cell phones, um, Metro cards, and also we offer anger management and substance use prevention programming, normally which is mandated by their parole officers once they parole. So we have that program also available. And so, <clears throat> While I was employed, I became I came home May 23rd, 2017, and I was employed by network the next month in June and put me to work quick. So <laughs> I just hit the ground, started running. And so later on, fast forward, I met Professor Zaccarini out of Delphi. How do we met? It's an incredible story. Christine, I'm surprised you didn't explain to them how we met, <laughs> but it was fabulous how we met because, again, I never knew I would end up with, at a segment like this in Adelphi or be a part of the, the, the Mindfulness Resolution Project. So I used to drive this smart car, this little tiny little electric vehicle and that I purchased back in 2018. And it it needs a, um, a charge. I have to find a charge station because it has a small little battery. So everywhere I drive, I can't drive too far. I have to find a, a charging station. So I GPS, I'm, I live in Nassau County. So I GPS the nearest charging station and a Delphi came up. Delphi University, it came up on the map. I said, okay, well, let me try Delphi. So I tried Delphi and this was in 2000 and 2018 and August, when I first touched the campus of Adelphi. And I was parked downstairs under, underneath the, the field. I forgot what the name of that field is, but it's an it's a, it's a, it's a underground parking lot under there where you can charge your vehicle. So I'm charging my vehicle. So one day I met a staff member there in Adelphi, her name was Natalie. And she fell in love with the car. So me and her got acquainted and I explained to her that I'm an outreach coordinator for network support services. I explained to her my, my function. She was like, oh, wow, I was just assuming I would like you to meet. So she 
gave me Professor Zacharini information. And then me and Professor Zacharini hooked up. And <laughs> Professor was telling me how she'd been trying to work on this project for a while and like kept falling. She raised it up and it fall back down and, and it all just connected, right? So my job, my role in this, in this project basically is to make sure that the students have network alumni individuals available to interview. So I put up, I put together a system. The system that I put up is basic, I put together is basic, basically simple. So I have access as an outreach coordinator, I have access to the men who, is, who are participating in our network in the prison programming. So what happens is I get from the um, the coordinators of the facilities a listing of individuals who are um, who are about to be released from prison, have release dates, and I will actually send information inside so that the coordinators can read uh, and setting to the participants the my this resolution project, um, you know, the outline. So they could become more familiar with what the project is about. And perhaps if they're interested, I would get their information. And so when they are released and I contact them to find out if they are currently still interested, if they are, then I will submit that list to the professor and the professor will follow up by contacting these individuals once they're home. And there have been problems with this project. Initially, with the first um, semester, the problem that we had was individuals, sometimes they come home and they get caught up in a lot of issues of life, but they can't really handle so many things at one time, so they get sidetracked. So the students will try to find out whether or not these individuals are still interested because they're not communicating to them through the email or by way of phone. So Christina, she contacts me and I find these individuals to inquire to find out what's happening. And once I'm able to do that, convince them, you know, that this program is something that can help them. Because like Art was saying, a lot of these guys have stories to tell powerful stories, right? And my thinking is that with this project, why not capture these stories and use it as part of a mindfulness project where society can become more open, less judgmental when it comes down to formerly incarcerated individuals because over the period of years, like, Art was alluding to these prison stories. They they make it whereas prison is just a, a cruel thing, and these guys coming home, they don't they shouldn't be given that attention to help them transition. They shouldn't be given uh, the same entitlements as ordinary citizens in our society. Why? Because they committed a crime. At one time, that sentiment was actually being pumped in, into society but it was doing harm to society in such a way where as if you keep a person incarcerated <clears throat> for one year in, state, in a New York state prison, it costs us $65,000 a year. And we have to pay for that. So one of my goals as, as, as the coordinator of outreach, as the outreach coordinator for network is to reduce the recidivism rate, bring it down. and in the course of doing that, give these guys, right, who want to give them a chance, these guys who signed up for contract, contract for change in our program, give them an opportunity to voice, let their stories be heard. Give them an opportunity to demonstrate to society that they're not these monsters, that they're these bad men that's going to come out and, and destroy our neighborhoods. Because what we're building here are assets to our community, not liabilities. And 
as art as a board member, he can contest our recidivism rate is so low because of programs like this. We can take this project and introduce it back into the correctional facilities so that the men and women, because we're about to have women a part of our programming. I think Bedford, right, Art, is one of the facilities where we'll be establishing network program in the prison. So now we'll be having women participate in our program. And we would like for them to see exactly what we are producing. That way, <clears throat> this project, it can expand. You got to create a demand, right? So we want to create that demand. And the more stories that we can generate and the more bios, the summaries that we can create, because our next step to this program is creating an index made available to employers, landlords, or any stakeholders who have access to this index, these profiles of these, of these magnificent men and the work that the students have done as far as put together the summaries, they become marketable, right? If I was an employer, I'm part of the Adelphi Network Collaboration Mindfulness Resolution Project. I'm in. So I have access to a catalog, an index of, of individuals who have been rehabilitated, who went through extensive uh, therapeutic training. And imagine a landlord knowing that a possible tenant had participated in this program who has uh, employment already secured, the idea is to take away the prejudice, the judgmental, oh, he's a former incarcerator, he's a convict. No, I'm not going to have this guy in my, occupy any rooms in my apartment. Or the employee, no, this guy, he has robbery or he made still. We wanted, this project is designed to take away that prejudice. And we're going to do it, that's our goal, <laughs> right? Professor and art, <laughs> that's our goal. That's part of mindfulness. This is something new and very creative. And I just like to thank Art, um, Professor Zacharini, also uh, the two young ladies in the Innovative Center because it, it really couldn't be possible without um, Zainab and um, Zainab and um, Hello. yes. Hello. This wouldn't be possible. So I have to include them into this as well. So um, that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. Okay. Wonderful. Fiorella? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Zacharini, Art Jones, and Ashan Jackson for being our artists today. On Monday, November 22nd at 2.30, uh, we will have Professor Cindy McGuire and Anne Holt present Arts Action Group, Arts Coalitions Through Socially Engaged Art. Before I open up the floor to any questions, um, there's going to be a short poll popping up on your screen right now, if you can fill that out. Um, for more information, you can visit our website, adelphi.edu slash artivism. Our Instagram is artivism for shared humanity, or you can simply Google artivism at Adelphi. Our YouTube channel is for shared humanity. We are hosting an open call art installation for all creative thinkers in our Instagram. If you would like to get more involved on this ongoing initiative, please contact the Artivism team at artivism at adelphi.edu. I would now like to ask if there are any questions for our artivists, please use the raise hand function, uh, unmute yourself, or if you're in the classroom, you can shout out your question. Okay, we have one question in the back here, young man. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say thank you to the artism, for the artism team for presenting their side of what peace is really about and how we can overcome any, you know, any anything that we set our minds to. Um, this is for the prisoner who is wrongly convicted of 25 years. I am very proud of you for staying strong, even though 25 years is a long period of time for your boy and family and friends, you somehow, somewhere took, put, put one foot over the other and you persevered through something. And I feel like if someone was wrong convicted of 25 years for something they have absolutely no recollection or did nothing, 
then it was robbed and you know they would not be taken away and the fact that you were able to step up and really just not give up is truly wonderful and i want to thank you for sharing that with us that's truly amazing thank you. Yeah. So y'all, y'all can hear. Um, it's a weird setup here because the students are not on their own individual computers. We're all in the room together. So, and we don't have a microphone. Oh, we have a hand. A hand. It went up and then it disappeared. There you go. I think it was a clapping emoji. Oh, it was a clapping. Oh, I got confused. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have questions from, uh, oh, we have another young woman over here. What's your name? Um, my name is Shayla. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation because it showed like the issues of how we see people as the others, for example. So I guess my question is, how would we be able to engage the community as a whole in, I guess, sort of like dismantling this idea of like viewing people in prison as like the other, even like homeless people as the other, like how can we engage the community as a whole? would like to address that question? Uh, how can we go about um, reframing yeah. how we view the quote unquote other? Uh, okay, so I guess I could say I, it's not as though we want to impose mindfulness on others, but just to speak mindfully about this in a way that introduces non-judgment and also discussing the common needs of human beings helps to break down these kinds of stereotypes. So mindfulness is about taking down stereotype bias. And so how do you reach out to someone, you know, in a community who has um, that kind of bias to connect on the basis of need and then to, to have dialogue and to actually bring individuals, I mean, many of the individuals working with network support services are actually in volunteer positions. They work to help people who have no homes. They are activists. So even having a dialogue with one of them is enough to change the hearts and minds of one or more people. So just by this engagement, I would say. Nashan, what do you think? I would agree. I mean, Conscious, mindfulness is, is basically being aware or becoming aware of certain things that people had no knowledge of because they were never taught, nor have they been exposed to what we're actually trying to show, so to speak. Knock down the wall of prejudice, like um, Professor Zachary was saying. So with the viewing of the video, what art put together, would be one of the components that we would use to address your question. I also wanted to add for my students and also one of the themes of the uh, artivism initiative overall is the idea of the sociological imagination, which I've tried to hammer into my students' heads in this class, is the idea <laughs> of seeing things with fresh eyes, looking at the world. It's not necessarily about like, oh, I, I changed my mind 180%. It's, it's looking at something in a way that said, huh, I never thought about it that way. And one of the things we've been talking about in the past couple of weeks in my class is the idea of the recidivism rate, which Nishan and others have mentioned. And the idea that we pay to warehouse millions of people on average $65,000 a year. You know, it's 180,000 per juvenile in New York per year. That's more than it costs to send them to Harvard. And so why would you want, and we know that most people will get out of prison. So why would you want there to be a 67% recidivism rate where, where most people get out of prison and end up back in prison within three years? And we understand the reasons why. And if you really wanted to address the issues of social harm and crime, why wouldn't you address that issue? and give folks the resources they need so that when they do get out, they can become productive citizens. Even if you don't care, you know, some people are like, oh, you tree hugger, you love, you know, whatever. And it's like, no, I hope that you have a soul, but even if you don't, even if you have no empathy, which I hope you have some, but if it, even if you don't, you should care as a citizen of a society. 
that all of these resources are going to warehouse people instead of helping individuals become productive members of society. So notice, I, I, uh, if, if I may, I mean, that, I think what you just had to say was powerful. Um, and I am aware of the economic argument for ending mass incarceration. I'm aware that there are enough people who simply respond to the economics that will save you know, the taxpayers money. We will each be paying less if we keep people out of prison. And to me, I guess it's, it's a necessary argument for those that you can't bring into the boat any other way. But to me, it's such a sad approach to it because it's, it's the last resort argument for those who can't see it any other way than it's gotta be about money and money coming out of their pocket. The elements that come to my mind uh, is it's usually when I see the guys you know, inside to, to a man, to a person, they are wearing green, prison green. It's kind of a forest green. And, and to this day, I can't put on a shirt that has that color. There's nothing in my wardrobe because I just can't handle it for what it represents. But the wild first piece of transformation that breaks down the quote unquote other factor, the wall, is when you meet these men when they've come home and they're wearing an outfit not unlike yours. They're not wearing their prison green. They're not identified as other. They're not inside. And that's almost like right off the bat, you've got a civilian in front of you. The more powerful thing, I think, comes down to the one-on-one -on -one encounters with, with the, the formerly incarcerated man, where if you find yourself talking about family, um, I've got a, an 18-year-old son, and I got incredible advice during difficult times with my 18 year old son. I got incredible advice from the guys inside who had children and grandchildren. And then suddenly you're getting your advice from a wise friend. You're starting to realize that these men have incredible answers for problems in society that we all walk around and we can't figure out you know, how to solve them. There's wisdom there and the commonality comes in when you realize you share family you are all struggling to make friends you're struggling to find acceptance you're dealing with issues of loneliness as everybody does because then there's a basic common denominator of a shared humanity there we get down to we are one and we don't see the other you know but it, it's got to take more of that one-on-one -on -one that Nashon and Dr. Zaccarini have been able to improvise and others have been able to do, but th there's nothing like it. You meet somebody, you meet their humanity, you share so much with them, they cannot be denied, you know? Thank you, Mr. Jones. Joseph, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, I like to... Um... Congratulate everyone on a great presentation. I have a question for Nashawn Jackson. Nashawn, first of all, uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, I have a question. You said that this is now going to expand, I guess, to the women's facilities. And from your experience and from what you've been through, do you think it's something that that will happen at a much faster pace than what the current program that that's in place? Yes, and the reason why I say that is because. Being that I'm in it, for I see the development stages, especially with the mindfulness resolution project. So, once we are currently structured inside these other facilities that we just merged, we just merged with a sister organization. So we're going to be operating nine New York State correctional facilities. We are currently operating in four, but. Um, next year, by next year, we'll be actually merged together, fully operating. And the way that the professor and I have this project developed and structured, all we need to make sure is that individuals that are participating in our prison programs are aware of this project. I applaud all of you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Jackson, we have another question for you in the chat. 
Veronica asks, do you think you would be in this position that you are in today if it wasn't for what you have experienced in the past? Well, I believe that everything that I went through in life prepared me for the experience. And what forms that belief is just by reflecting on my life. Like, just look back, how'd I end up here? You know, when I was incarcerated, my program consists of law library, which I was a law library clerk, I was employed. Um, I was a part of inmate organizations, either serving as a secretary, as a clerk, as a president, as a chairperson. So I didn't know that I would be getting myself groomed by these activities that I was participating in when I was incarcerated. I wasn't the type of guy that you would find me, you would find in the yard playing basketball or sitting on the bleachers watching movies or walking around the yard just, just kicking it with my friend. And no, you'll find me in the law library, <laughs> you know, in the books. But understanding so that I was disciplining myself at the same time. And the more knowledge that you accumulate, the more disciplined you become. Because to me, I only can speak on my personal experience. The more knowledge that you acquire, the greater the challenges are there in life. So this is a challenge. This project is a challenge. Because like I said, I have to chase these guys down. I, there's so much goes on with putting this project together and making it work and having the effect that it has now. And I believe it's going to have a greater effect because this is the second semester and we just started it. <laughs> so. Can I interject? Oh, sure. Yeah, we also have that YouTube channel, the Mindfulness Resolution Project. So we started the index. And yeah, I could put it in the chat box. And so, and we have a blog. So we're making an index, you know, that will then keep moving forward. And we also are helping with employment and housing. So the class is doing much more this semester than last semester. It's really expanded. And we've got internships and we're making a um, hotline at Adelphi for individuals who need help. So it has already gone forward quite a bit. I also want to remind everyone, um, I run the internship program here at Adelphi through the criminal justice program. And you know, this is an opportunity. We've been working with the Deskovic Foundation for Justice for over the past six or seven years. And I've had students intern uh, and they do some of the work, similar work that you all are doing. Their main focus, Jeff Deskovic. I don't know if Nishan, you've had the- Yes, oh, you've I know. Him. Okay. So Jeff has been, was wrongfully convicted and was, um, was uh, ultimately exonerated and received a settlement, which he used to create a foundation. And he helps others who claim wrongful conviction, but he also helps those who've been released integrate back into society with a variety of services. And I've had probably around seven students intern so far, and three of them have gone on to law school. And, and it's, you know, something that they plan on doing um, beyond. I want to type into the yeah. chat. Professor Zacharini is going to type uh, the website for you all. Yeah. For the it's actually page. two. Yeah. I would like to take a second here where uh, Dr. Zacharini is typing it into the chat to thank our marvelous student ambassador, Fiorella Alvin Alvinas. And let's give her a round of applause, everyone. Perfect, excellent. Also to our presenters, and uh, I know we're a bit over time, but if we can just take a minute each to go around, Dr. Zacharini, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jones, what will be a key takeaway from today's presentation that you would like to leave the audience for an action-oriented, um, you know, um, step from this presentation? Well, I would say is understanding the nature of, of, of what this project is about, right? And listening and hearing what myself, Art, and Christina had to say about this project, um, we have to promote it. We have to go in areas where people 
have already developed a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Like Professor Zaccarini, she she came to me and said, Nishan, I need to find employees that doesn't hire formerly incarcerated individuals. That's a challenge. <laughs> so we have to bring something like this in those areas, break down those walls. And that's the challenge. that we would like for the students, the student body, Adelphi University, network, everyone play a role because at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're changing the way society judge people. We're bringing a sense of new human, a, 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 a idea of humanity back into the world where it was once lost. We're trying to bring something back that has been lost. And it has become more difficult more than ever now because of social distancing, whereas communication is being cut off. All the things that humans actually utilize as tools to build societies in light of the COVID-19 obstacle, it, it has been like an obstacle towards that. So the Mindfulness Resolution Project is the ideal project at this moment of time to, to confront these social ills and everything that falls in that category. Um, I'll just be brief and limited to a minute. I know that this criminal justice class is about crime and punishment and we live in a very punitive minded society and it would be really great to you know move away from shame and blame and look at instead the commonality is like Art said, you know, the things that we have in common as humans, which is what my students did with the participants from Network. And that's what made it so special that my students were able to see the, the things that made them um, share uh, qualities with the men that they um, interviewed. And so to start looking at people and thinking, wow, we have more things in common than I thought, instead of looking at them and saying, oh, you're so different, you know? Um, so, and in that regard, in terms of the project that we're working on, you know, this project is, is really a passion of mine because there's such a, a really great need, but really for, I'd like everybody to think about how powerful you are as students. 30% of the population in the United States goes to college. You're really in a position to change the world. And you know, think about that. And remember, you have a powerful voice, just like my students. I was incredibly proud of the, of the confidence that they showed. And that was after starting the class with so much fear. So you know, that's what I'd like for you to take away um, from this. Thank you. And let's see. I um, two brief thoughts. I mean, I, I was hammering earlier on how impressed I was with the students in the classroom who really had a sense at age 18 of what they wanted to do with their life. So that is powerful. And I know there's a real drive at Adelphi and at many colleges for someone at age 17 or 21 to have figured it out and to know what you will enter the world as. And uh, I, I want to be one of the voices that says, you know, take the pressure off yourself. <laughs> and if you do anything as a student, uh, it doesn't have to be about figuring out a career. It's, it's be curious. It's ask more questions and, and, you, and, and live with the questions because rarely do you get answers. If you figure out what you want to do at 29, 35, 62, or someone that I know at 81 who just figured it out, you take your time. Because the big question is, you know, you, you definitely do have talents to apply and you have a voice and a viewpoint, but where you, where you place it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be set in stone at 20 or 21. You can find your way the same way these men and women inside are thoughtfully thinking about where they want to place their first step when they're out. And it's not clear, but you know, you find your way. Uh, this, so I just say, take the pressure off. You know, I got it together in my life career-wise about two weeks ago. <laughs> I've been at this for a while. 
And I say that with modesty. Um, then just the other piece is um, I, I offer a challenge to, to all those viewing, particularly the students, which is in your life tomorrow on the subway, at a party, wherever you are, venture out to someone you consider the other and reach out to the other and talk to them. You know, we, we all are making judgments constantly. We're always separating an us and them, even the most mindful of us. So when you get into those situations, how do you see the bank teller in front of you differently? How do you see the barista differently? You're renting a car, you're losing your mind with the Hertz agent. How do you see them humanly? How do you see that person across uh, the way, uh, you know, on the bus aisle or in the subway? Uh, they look different, dress different. Maybe they're talking to themselves. Get in on that conversation. Maybe what they're saying has a lot of wisdom, but I challenge you to venture into the world of the other and make, make them one with you, have a conversation. And it's always a good exercise. I'm trying it. I'm not great at it. I think by age 92, I may get the hang of it. And I, I hope that you get there earlier than I. Okay, um, thank you everyone. I do wanna say that um, I teach for the criminal justice department um, um, program, art behind bars, art as therapy. And I was talking to Dr. Zaccarini about maybe bringing the arts to network services. Uh, my students will be creating um, a plan for arts programs that they can potentially, potentially um, teach or run a program via Zoom or a workshop with Dr. Dr. Zaccarini and hopefully Nishan can speak to my students as well to inspire them, give them a little more background. Um, I want to thank all of you, um, uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Jackson and Dr. Zaccarini, uh, Delphi University for sponsoring us. Sync for Hope and Goddesman Libraries at Teachers College at Columbia University. Uh, this has been great. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much to Dr. Um, Dr. Lake. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Lake. <laughs> I, I, be well, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Be well. Stay I'm safe. You. Thank you. Settle down. Everyone settle down. <laughs>